Hey, I'm Corey Baldwin. And I'm Dan Searle, and this is Off the Beaten Path, the podcast for basketball coaches who are living in obscurity, working in obscurity, and even a few who have made it out of obscurity. And it's a place for storytelling, learning, connecting, and even some food, food for thought and food for the belly. Yes, sir. And today we'll start by telling our own stories and how we ended up here. We'll start right there. Corey, this concept of off the beaten path for basketball coaches has been in your mind for a long time. Tell us a little bit about where it came from, why it matters, why should we even be listening? <laughs> well, I, where it came from, I once, uh, I used to have some coaches call me. I still do from time to time, but I used to have a lot more when I was in uh, an assistant at Clayton State, which is uh, south of the Atlanta airport. And uh, they would always ask me, hey, man, we, we need the uh, – two or three of them would say this term. We need the off-the-beaten-path players. You know, we know the guys inside 285. You seem to always know the ones outside. Tell us about the ones off the beaten path. And I kind of started taking that term and I, thinking about it. Uh, that was a long time ago. Now I've been a college coach here, just finished 21 years, and all I've done is live off the beaten path. And I started thinking, man, it'd be great to have a show for guys who are, you know, there with me or ones who are getting there. Maybe they're not even to the off the beat path yet. And then the ones who have survived and moved on, like you said in the intro. And I thought, man, we need we need something for coaches, you know, in, in those areas. And I've been kind of pitching this podcast for a little while. And, and Cyril, you're the craziest one that would kind of roll with it. So, so here we are. I hear you. Can't wait to tell stories, hear stories. Today's going to be a little weird for us because we may be talking a little bit more about ourselves, which is not our favorite thing to do, although it may sound like that um, in this episode, but want to make sure everybody knows who's who, what's what, and that we were able to pull together those stories from, from off the beaten path of the, the basketball world, right? From the, from the littles all the way through those college years. 21 years of college coaching, huh, Corey? It doesn't seem that long because that's the great thing about being in coaching. Uh, but then when you start thinking through all the guys you coached and coached with and coached for and who's coached for you and et cetera, et cetera, it starts uh, being a long list. I think something that's neat about this and one of the reasons uh, you're, you're the best for this is you're a guy who has been in and out of this off the beaten path. Uh, Searle, a lot of people probably, uh, you know, won't, won't know your story, but I mean, you're a guy who has, who has coached NBA players and you're a guy who, who currently is coaching NBA players' kids uh, at, at age of 10 and 12 and, and things of that nature. You've also coached, been on the women's side, you've been on Division One, Division Division Two, NAI, Division Three. You've been a little mm -hmm. bit of everywhere. You coached some JV teams in college, and you've coached high school girls. So uh, let's go down your path a little bit. It might take a second, but but kind of walk us through the old resume. Wow. Hey, um, it's kind of fun to go down memory lane, but step back to senior year in high school in Spain, in Mija, Spain, southern Spain, with beautiful views of the Mediterranean. All I cared about was basketball. So as I was playing on the local town team, the, the Mijas group there, I was also coaching a, a bunch of eighth graders um, as they were developing in basketball and we're trying to build the, the club team there. When I came to the States in college, I, the idea was to be a broadcaster and here we are doing a podcast, right, years later. So yep. uh, when I was in college at Northwestern up in the Chicago area, I ended up working couldn't really afford college up there on my own. So I had a work study going and my job was the team manager for the women's basketball team at Northwestern. That was a great spot. I got to travel the big 10 and guess what? They paid me to play basketball. It was quite ridiculous. How mm -hmm. I practiced with the team every day, every day. So I was the, the guy on the, the women's team who would be the scout player who would, uh, push the post players around, that kind of thing. Most of them were better than me though, but those memories really uh, will stick forever. And it also helped me realize that, forget this broadcasting thing and calling games, I wanna coach. I wanna be that much closer to the game by coaching it. And uh, 
moved down to Atlanta after graduating with a job at CNN, dream job for the broadcaster, right? Not so much, not so much. I ended up finding a volunteer gig at Emory University, Division Three. And if you're still listening, you'll keep listening. If not, hopefully you'll find something more interesting to hear about. But here's what the schedule was like. I worked the overnight shift at CNN from 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. I'd go home, try to nap for a little bit. I'd head over to Emory, do some recruiting calls, prep practice, have the practice session with Coach Pete Manuel, the head coach there, as we got ready for the next UAA opponent, and then get a little bit of dinner and head back over to the CNN Tower in the Omni downtown and work overnight and start the cycle the next day. Uh, All right. Good time, let's, let's lots of time, but that, that was that, that buzz for basketball, no doubt. Yes, well, let's stop you right there, sir, and, and, and backtrack a little bit. A couple of interesting things. One, so you're a manager for the women's Division One team, North, uh, Northwestern, I'm sorry. I tried to put you in Boston. Not yeah, Chicago. watch out, man. Northeastern, Northwestern, not the same place. Nowhere near. So anyway, so, <laughs> so you're in Chicago at Northwestern in the Big Ten, correct, at yep. that time? Correct. And, uh, and that's kind of where a separation of six degrees occurred for me and you. Your senior year, as you're the manager and practice player, uh, you, you play a first-round opponent. And when the women's tournament, I believe, was still only 32 teams at that time, correct? It was. I think they moved it to 48 because we had some player, some teams with a bye. Okay. So we were at 48. And I want to say that might even been the first year it went to that. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and who, who was your first-round opponent? First-round opponent for the Northwestern women's team advancing at the NCAA tournament was – Georgia Tech out of Atlanta. Team I didn't really know about. I just knew that, hey, we were in the NCAA tournament. This is a huge deal for the, uh, what, for the Northwestern Wildcats. Correct. And that ties us together as my sister was on that team at Georgia Tech. And that was their first ever national tournament appearance at the time. So it was a big deal. So me and Cyril connected and didn't even know it. Northwestern beat the Yellow Jackets and advanced to, to what ended up being getting drilled by Georgia Tech. I mean, after getting past Georgia Tech, getting drilled by Tennessee down in Knoxville with Pat Summit on the sidelines. That was not a great reward for winning that game, right? Having to go see Pat Summit. And to make but you feel you old, Earl, just so you know, that was my senior year in high school. Hey, and, uh, there we senior. go. All right. So now we come to Atlanta. So you're at the CNN Center, you're doing a night shift, catching a nap, making phone calls, setting up practices. Were, were you not also doing something in the dorms at that time or no? <laughs> that's, that's a story to tell right there. As uh, one of those years at Emory, the, the dorm work was the, uh, the house director for Kappa Alpha fraternity on the Emory campus, which... Uh, as a, an assistant coach, you're not getting paid too much. So any of those little uh, extras that you can gather up um, really help you, right? And we talk about off the beaten path, you're taking volunteer jobs, uh, coaching, and you're trying to scrap together as much other options as you can and a little food and a place to stay there as I was trying to keep an eye on those, those Kappa Alphas was, uh, was a good thing to have. And that's one of the things I, I hope for young, young wannabe coaches, dreaming to be coaches, uh, guys maybe even looking to switch over gears of where they're coaching, can, can get from this podcast and from stories like yours, the amount of uh, sacrifice you had to take for time, obviously. You pretty much had none, no free time, none of your own time, uh, in order to do what you considered your own time, which was the coaching part. Right, but at the same time, it, it felt like it was all my time. I loved everything that I was doing. From the, the, the work in the dorms to the extra practices to the recruiting to all those options were great experiences, right? And you can find that. It's, it's hard work. It's lots of time. But if it's something that you love, you can piece it together and, uh, and make it work and enjoy it. And you also, they had a JV team then, correct? I don't know if they do now, but they did then, correct? 
Emory JV team. My first year, I was an assistant for Mike Phillips, who was a, a national champion golf coach also. He showed me the ropes <laughs> with that crew. And then by year two, I was uh, taken over the role of that uh, the head coach of the Emory JV team. And I got to crisscross the state of Georgia with some great matchups, north and south, and, and some stories that also connect, Corey. Yes, yes. You you played at a, a place I later, later was the head coach at, Truett McConnell, and you ate at the old barbecue joint, of course, on the way up to Cleveland, Georgia, right? Black River Barbecue. That was a great spot to go. Uh, some players like Evans Davis, who then went on to Mercer and putting up some big numbers, was on that Truett team, and he took care of our Emory JV players quite handily, but – Big one was we beat Reinhardt when they were a two-year. Um, we'd go way down to uh, middle Georgia when they were uh, doing their two-year thing. Is, uh, some great players. Um, what's our guy that went up to, to Connecticut that was at middle Georgia back in the 90s? Oh, yeah, yeah. So you played when Duke Mullis was the head coach there, correct? Yep, Duke was the head coach there at that time, yep. Yeah, some good, those are good teams. <laughs> Very really good team, really good players. I'll try to remember that guy's name. Um, it was uh, Hardnet. Hardnet is that the last name? Something like that. It was at Middle Georgia. Iowa um, State too, right? What's that? Yeah, the kid that went to Iowa State too, right? That was real good. Yep. Mm -hmm. So some some big time squads that that we yeah. uh, that we went up against. Even got to go to Lagrange College, and uh, that was actually the first game that we played as a as a JV squad. Uh, exciting times, Lagrange, uh, as they were transitioning, also coming into that D three world. Well, let's talk a second about JV and the college level. It's such a different aspect, and I think a lot of times uh, the normal fan or even the normal coach that hasn't coached at a place where there's a JV or played against JVs in college or played for one or whatever, have no idea really what the concept is. Most people assume it's like high school where it's just guys that didn't make the varsity, but that's really not so much the case. Can, can you, and every player is different. Every path is different as we'll learn doing off the beaten path. But what was the JV for at Emory? Tell us, get, kind of get us inside that. I think that's as far off the beaten path as you can get. A D3 JV. A D3 JV, right? Yeah, volunteer coach. And Emory uh, was a good program then. They're a great program now, so I'm not taking any shots at all. I don't want nobody to think that. Uh, right. But kind of, kind of tell us that, you know, what that was. Yeah, Jason Zimmerman, who's the head coach at Emory now, doing a fantastic job there. They're in the NCAAs on a regular basis. But the JV program, why do you have it? You hope that there's a couple players that come through that develop that end up contributing on that first team, no doubt about it. But it also allows you to increase the involvement, the numbers, the participation, where you've got more of your students who are attending the college involved in on-campus activities. And it can be from a recruiting standpoint. It can also be just like a, that word that I've said a, a few times is the participation piece where you got people plugged in to important things going on on campus. And Emory is a little different because it has the, the, the two-year feeder out at Oxford. So uh, a few players came from Oxford that were playing on the first team at Emory too. Um, Oxford being out there in the, the Conyers-Covington area and uh, ties right into Emory after two years there. And they are Division three junior college we'll have to get Roderick Stubbs on here the current coach because again that's off the beaten path as well it uh, most sure people is. Think, well, there's divisions in junior college they just but there's actually three division one division two and division three so that's kind of that's kind of a, a fun fact to throw in there sir in the middle of story time here it okay. sure is well and then that's what this is all about we gotta we gotta come up with some of those facts tell people about them some people will know it others will be really there's three levels of uh, junior college i had no idea so so now we take it you're 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 at emory you're you're volunteering you're doing a lot of side jobs you came down here for the original job which was cnn uh so now are you doing any other school work 
are you doing a master's program? Are you thinking about getting into that at this point? Is that something Emory's kind of telling you you might need? Are you saying at this point, hey, I'm going to be a college basketball coach? Uh, walk me through those couple of questions. I don't want to give you too many, but those are kind of ones I'm thinking as I'm hearing the story, even though I know the story, I'm, I'm enjoying it. That's a good prompt, good segue there. But at Emory, one thing that happened from the volunteer role is Mike Phillips, who was that assistant and the JV coach, stepped away and they offered me the full-time assistant gig for a, a whopping 10 grand a year. And I accepted it. Yeah, exactly. I accepted it in a heartbeat. Um, quit my job at CNN and uh, my, my parents thought I was absolutely crazy and took the, took the job there. And while I'm the assistant at Emory, I'm also working basketball camps all over the country. I had a couple of crisscrosses from the Floridas and the Dukes to the Arizonas and even Stanford one year driving all over the wonderful country here to, to work basketball camps and, and have a blast along the way and then make a couple extra bucks uh, to try to keep, uh, keep living, right? But Wait, I'll stop you there, sir, because I think that's a great thing to talk about. Basketball camps are, are obviously right now with the quarantine are non-existent. But even before the quarantine, they had started taking a, a, a dip. They're not as popular as they once were on college campuses. I know when I got into coaching in 99 in college coaching, I was told to work as many as you could. That's how you get a college job. And I think when people heard that in my generation got a little upset because they were like, you know, I work Bobby Crimmins. He doesn't even talk to me. I'm not going to get that job. Well, that's not what they meant, and it's what you're right. saying. You made more connections with other guys working in camp who were trying to get jobs, and it may be five or ten years later, but it'll come where that guy may help you, even though that wasn't totally the reason you did it. I know I used to work them as well, and they were, man, some of the most fun times I ever had were working uh, at four-year college camps. Uh, so tell us a little bit about that. So you went to Stanford, Duke. It you, you, you just described that perfectly, Corey, though. You, you work the camp because you love working the camp, being around basketball, being with other people. And mm -hmm. those, those coaches that are working the camp with you, it's a long-term thing. They may end up in gigs that tie in and help with jobs. They may not. Um, nobody's calling me for college jobs right now, I'll tell you that much. Um, but I still stay in touch with a bunch of people from those camps. And the memories that get created from that last in your brain for a long time. And we can, we can go through some different names along the way and where people are now. But I remember Duke camp on a regular basis, um, an annual basis for four or five years um, that worked out in a really fun, fun way. And old Miss camp with Rod Barnes and, and his staff, there was a, a senior there that was uh, pretty involved with playing and then moved on to other places and recruited some of our players, uh, a, a Mike White guy, that name may ring a bell in the SEC. Um, off to Arizona with Lute Olson and that staff at the time, uh, current Georgia Tech head coach, Josh Passner was the walk on on that, those Arizona squads and you play pickup with them in, in the evenings and out to Stanford right after they'd been to the final four, Mike Montgomery and now, oh, well, it ties back into, you, you talk about small world circles, Eric Reveno was an assistant out there who's uh, now at, at Tech also. So just good memories, good times, good Great. people um, that, you, that you have to have the mindset to appreciate if that makes sense, kind of back to what you say. Enjoy the moment, the basketball, the human side of it, and uh, good stuff will come from it, no doubt. One, one of the things I always remember, uh, some of it was through your advice uh, and through uh, Coach Hebron, who, who I worked for and played for at Clayton State, but uh, was when working these camps was to, to try to be involved with anything they did. So uh, I can remember you know, I worked Patino's camps when he was at first got to Louisville, his first three years. Um, and uh, they would do nighttime meetings. So you would just stay up, even though you knew you were going to have to wake up at six in the morning 
you'd stay up to three and hang out and made so many, uh, you know, things that shape your thoughts and your mind as a coach, but also you meet people and you have a good time as well. And then I can remember doing the opposite at Wake Forest when Dave Odom was there. They met every morning at six after he ran. I guess he ran at five or something. And they would meet at six and do an X and O thing. And uh, you had, you know, all kind of guys on his staff that are current head coaches at other places. Mm -hmm. All the other guys in the room that became, you know, college coaches, high school coaches, AAU coaches, whatever. And, uh, you know, it's just neat looking back. You know, Georgia Tech was always my favorite. Obviously, I, I'm a Tech fan, so I'm biased. But Kremens always did a good job, and, he, and Paul Hewitt after, on doing, uh, you know, making the all the coaches at work that feel involved. And it, it, good times, man. Good times. I definitely remember them. So it's neat that that was, that was some of your, your makeup as well. Uh, if you had to list right now, give me your top three camp places you ever worked. And Ooh. I'll give mine. I'm, I'm going to be that I guy. Absolutely. That's a good one. You're, you're, you're a top three. Are we sticking to three or are you going to give us seven? Well, people that listen know I'll, I'll have a couple of ties and uh, honorable mentions and it'll end up being a top ten. But let's say it's a top three right now and see if we can stick to it. All right. Let me let me go back and, uh, and think through these. I'm going to – fan or not of the Blue Devils, I'm going to put the Duke camp up there um, mm -hmm. in the top three for sure. Because How much of the, was Coach K involved? I know, I know fans, uh, coaches would want to know that. How much was he involved? Yep, and I'll give you that as an example. Coach K and his staff were all very, very involved in camp. I'm an awesome. Emory assistant, and I'm working the Duke camp, and I've got a, a station in Cameron Indoor, and Coach K is just walking around, and he sees my shirt and says, oh, hey, Coach Emory, that's a really good school. Hey, yeah, hey, keep doing your thing. I'm like, what, huh? He knows where Emory is and he's just talking to me. And, um, and I'm 22 at the time and this guy's uh, your basketball God. So he's involved, but then also the rest of the staff was in those first years, Snyder would be the one that would take you out for a bite to eat and talk in X's and O's. And then you're playing pickup with Wojo and Chris Collins and, and they actually pass you the ball um, kind of stuff. So um, from the, the Duke staff, including Coach K, to the people that come and work the camp, long time people, somebody been coming for 30 plus years working the Duke camps, to then the variety of kids that you have involved um, that are coming from all over the country because Duke is kind of a national name. So I put Duke in the top three. Um, the Arizona experience, which I did a couple of years, was also great. It was uh, a balance of intensity and laid backness as you head towards the West Coast. Mm -hmm. And staff was involved. Um, the access was there for film sessions, for um, talking to talking to players, and then they they give you some flexibility also in in what you're doing with your stations and your teams. Mm -hmm. And he'll he'll he comes a surprise for you. The other one in my top three is Michigan. Michigan wow. with Steve Fisher and Brian Dutcher. The way they combined competitiveness with the fun piece um, and Ann Arbor in general, Michigan camp back in the day was, uh, was one that's high on my list. And not to... Uh, keep you out of the loop. You know, you're talking about your top three becomes a top 10. I'm going to, I'm going to give you a plus one and that's okay. Clemson. Ooh. Clemson from Rick, the Rick Barnes days, uh -huh. the way they had it all set up and the people that come from the Southeast to work and participate. So we got a, we got a Duke an Arizona, a Michigan and a Clemson is a, is a list for you. I could keep going on, but uh, like uh, we'll cut it there. How about you? What are your camps? Uh, you I would go to Clemson and Tech. Clemson and Florida would be on the outside looking in. They're the honorable mentions. I worked Clemson's team camp for about three years uh, and loved every minute of it. And it was with different co head coaches. Uh, they had went through coaching changes, but yet, yet they kind of kept me there. And Man, I loved working it. Uh, met a lot of great people. Driscoll, who now is kind of a neighboring coach. He's at North Florida, which is only about an hour from where I am. Coach Driscoll. And mm -hmm. uh, often still tell stories about it and a neat part 
before I go to my top three is uh, the year we played in, in the national tournament at Hutchinson, Kansas. He came down and gave me a hug on the floor and said a long way from the doghouse, which was the gym I ran at the Clemson camp. So that was kind of a neat that the camp tied into that so many years later. And um, that he remembers, right? Yeah. You appreciate that kind of stuff. It oh, really man. is all about the people. Yeah, correct, correct. And that shows that, that those camps mean something to those guys too, uh, even though they had other maybe way more important things they were worried about. Uh, but that's uh, a good point. Yep. Yeah. And then uh, I would probably say my top three, uh, I would go Louisville because Patino was such a uh, – a figure and he was still involved and he took coaches out and he did workouts with players and uh, different things. And it was kind of neat. I, I was uh, real big into running at that time. And I would work out with his son who was now the head coach at uh, Minnesota. And uh, back then he was just mm-hmm. somebody more of a workout partner, you know? So that was kind of neat. Uh, I would say number two would be Auburn. And that was a different time of basketball at Auburn. That was when they were kind of in the heyday with uh, Cliff Ellis. Right. Uh, real good teams. And those camps were great because you just had a bunch of uh, guys like me, just a bunch of good old boys from Georgia and Alabama working a camp, you know. And <laughs> met a lot of people I still talk to, talk to now, you know. And then, uh, number one, I already said it, I, I get I, the drama's not there, but Georgia Tech, even though I drove to it, a lot of times I didn't even stay the night and work. Uh, it was a fun camp just because of uh, – A, Crimmins was the best at having people come back that had played there, worked there, moved on, et cetera, et cetera. And it was just such a crazy atmosphere, so many people working it, so many people there. Mm-hmm. And it was people that, uh, you know, I'd, you had heard of. So if you were a player, you might have knew a high school coach in Gwinnett County, but you never – Really knew him. Well, heck, now you're running a ball handling station with him. And uh, that was kind of neat. And uh, just different things like that. I, I really enjoyed it, though, because they did a good job at night of everybody getting together and talking hoops, playing cards, uh, dominoes, whatever your choice was, and, and telling stories like we are right now. And, and it, it, was, it was fun times. I, I would definitely put it number one. There you go, Georgia Tech. Yeah. I worked. I had quite a few Georgia Tech ones too. Enjoyed the uh, the blacktop outside between uh, O'Keefe and uh, the Coliseum there, trying to make sure kids weren't skinning their knees, and then enjoying those evening sessions for sure. Yes, yes, yeah, great, great stuff. So, Cyril, I, we 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 we, I, we got off the path. We got off the beaten path of what we were talking, but some good stuff, I think. So now you. You're you're the JV coach. You're full time with your with your whopping salary of ten thousand, right? And it's a full time job. You've given up your uh, CNN job, which is what you went to Northwestern to do. Uh, yeah, tell my tell my mom about that. She wasn't too pleased. <laughs> yeah, she probably wasn't real happy. So now uh, you're from Spain to Chicago to Atlanta, you've been the back roads playing these JV games, you're learning the state of Georgia. You play in a conference that plays all over the United States with Emory. It's one of the, at one time, it was the largest mileage separation of any conference at any level. I don't know if it still is. I know the WAC might have blew that away. The WAC and even the the American, the way things are spread out at the D1 level because of football, not anymore. But for the people who don't know, Division Three basketball, high-level hoops for starters, and that conference, the UAA, is it's pretty special. It's a great place to coach. I mean, on one weekend, you're going to play NYU in New York and Brandeis in Boston. So that's a, it's kind of like the Ivy League where you're doing a Friday-Sunday kind of deal and trying to miss as, uh, the least Did y'all fly then? Did you fly? fly? Yes. Okay. So that, that presidents, presidents and athletic directors – Back in the day, you know, 20 years ago, made that commitment to That's we're going awesome. to play these schools and we're going to fly and we're going to take care of our student athletes. They're not getting scholarships or anything like that, but, but that was funded and still is funded pretty well. So you were in all the major cities, really, New York, Boston, Atlanta. Who, who else was in that league? You do a Chicago St. Louis weekend for you, Chicago, and watch wow. you. Nice. And you do do a Pittsburgh Cleveland weekend with Carnegie Mellon and Case Western, and then there's the at the time the one off to to Rochester. Mm-hmm. 
That's pretty cool, man. Who who was your travel partner? Because you were in Atlanta. It didn't sound like anybody else was in the southeast. Who who was – did you have a partner or a team that – or was it Rochester just because you all were the two outliers? I'm trying to remember how that was, and I'm missing somebody. There there was – it wasn't a, a direct kind of travel partner like that for us. But when we were out and about, it was the that, that rotation to, you know, a Friday and a Sunday and the home so, team. Well, let me ask you this. You're in a – Division three league where at the time LaGrange and Oglethorpe was D3. I know there's more now with Piedmont and, and uh, Covenant and, and some other guys that have joined it. But at the time, it was just those two, correct, in, in Georgia, and they didn't play in your not, league? Not even LaGrange at the time. LaGrange was in that transition. It, the, okay. the closest were – it was Oglethorpe and it was Sewanee, University of the South, up there in Mount Eagle. Correct. Well, uh, and they were in the same league, I assume, but not in your league. Correct. Yeah, okay. So they were in a separate league together. Mm-hmm. Interesting. And the D3 is strange because, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, no D3s in Florida, correct? No. Yeah. So a lot of people recruit Florida. Exactly. What I've always Lots of players to come out of Florida there for the D3 level. Definitely. Oh, we know some of those guys. Over the years. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. It's pretty interesting. All right, so now what was at Emory, what was your biggest moment? And uh, let me re- let me uh, emphasize what I'm asking because it, the biggest moment okay. can mean a lot of things. So let me branch it into two questions. Biggest moment as what the fan would think it would be. So what was your winningest season or win- biggest game or biggest mm-hmm. finish or whatever. And then I guess the other part would be for you, what was your biggest moment that kind of defined your off the beaten path? It helped you be who Dan Searle is now looking oh. back at it. They, you should have gone into this old journalism thing and asking questions. You got, you got the right kind of prompts. Uh, Being in, I may have never left if I would have went there. <laughs> hey, a, a sidetrack. Van Earl Wright was yes. one of my favorites. Does anybody remember Van Earl Wright? Absolutely. Yeah. Headline it, news. Headline sports. <laughs> you had the great – he's still on some stuff every now and then, but, man, he always changed his voice. He was kind of my hero. But I, he was an Atlanta guy. So, you know, all right. So go ahead, Cyril. Go you back. love your Atlanta guys. <laughs> Number one on Corey's list will always be a, a Georgia Tech, an Atlanta guy, some kind of connection to the state of Georgia, that's for sure. Complete homer. <laughs> Very carry light, tying it back <laughs> to Chicago for you. And proud of it. There and you go. It. That's right. Um, I, I'm going to give you a, a couple of answers, one, one that's not necessarily a defining moment, but those memories from, from the Emory time. Mm. Um, Coaching JV, one of those big moments was we beat Reinhardt. Uh, Reinhardt had a really good coach and uh, and a couple good players. One big kid who went on to uh, Chris, who went on to play at Oglethorpe, and we're not, you know, the JV team at Emory is not supposed to beat this uh, strong two-year college, and we were able to to pull it off and surprise them. Big upset. Was that Gary Stark? Was that Gary Sharp coaching that team? Wasn't that his name? Or Gerald Sharp? Who was Gerald coach? Sharp? Yes, Gerald sir. Sharp. Mm-hmm. That's him. And he his family coach well at the known, time. Well known in this area, Alan Sharp, Andy Sharp. You know, they're all uh, college coaches now. Mm-hmm. They all well, tie. Uh, a renowned name in the state of Georgia hoop yeah. circles, no doubt. Yeah, definitely. So, right. so, so, so beating Ryan Hart, uh, winning a, a quote quote varsity game. Right. Yeah, exactly. If that's how you want to call it. That's what it yeah. kind of be the equivalent. Did it mean anything? Does it go to any kind of championship? No, not at all. And that's it. That's helped me over the years say, no, nobody remembers that or cares about it, but I, I've got it in my brain. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, that's awesome. Kind of off subject, but on subject uh, conversation with my assistants during the quarantine. Was yep. One of the first things we talked about was, what is winning? And uh, I know that might sound corny or silly, but, you know, define a winning season. Is it a, is it a banner? Is it a ring? Mm. And what's funny is a lot of times when you get those, you, you have to point at those a lot to remind people. But when you win in other areas, you don't really have to remind people. And that might sound a little corny, but I think it's true. Guys come back and tell you about graduating and come back and tell you about they learned when you made them run and it didn't matter that 
they had to run extra for being late to a shoot around. It may have lost them that game, but it won them three more. And they wow. remembered the, the value of that. And uh, just kind of interesting, a, a little off subject, but on subject, what you're saying, I think it's, it's funny how it works, you know, uh, in sports and in basketball in particular, when you have a, a smaller group that's together, you know, so. Right. It, it, you just said it and it, and it ties into to the other moment that I was going to bring up some of the best games I was involved in early on in my coaching career were losses, those memories that stick with you. And it was an Emory game at Rochester where Lewis Satterwhite were down by one and he gets a rebound with four and a half seconds and backs out and jacks it up and it goes in and, ah, we're going to win. Clock stops, right? On the made hoop with, 0.7 0.7 on the clock or something like that. Mm. And you're ready to celebrate. And this game has been intense and it's back and forth. And they throw it to the guy at the free throw line who turns and heaves it, swish at the other end. Oh my goodness. And you lose. But it's, you, you feel that joy may not be the word, but, but that, um, that feeling that that was a memorable game. I was just involved in one of those intense, great basketball games. I sure wish we'd come out on top, right? But, but you appreciate the, the competitors, the players are getting after it every second of what went down on that court. I think some of that in coaching, the longer you're in it, the, the losses stick out more for a lot of reasons. Uh, some sometimes hurt is easier to remember than than enjoyment, but but right. also you learn more when you lose, and uh, you know that'll take you to the old. You know, as a parent, if you're a helicopter parent, your kid never learns as much because you don't allow them to lose or be hurt. Right. And, uh, you know that goes. Right. Back. And the new term now with the the snowplow parents, right? Yeah. Coming through and clearing the ground completely so that they the and we're seeing it a lot right, right now in the quarantine with the uh with the uh, documentary last dance you know jordan is jordan because of the pistons the pistons are the pistons because of the celtics the celtics, right. celtics because of the lakers lakers for the lakers because of the sixers etc cetera, etc cetera. everybody had to beat up the bully and lose to the bully a few times to figure out how to beat up the bully mm-hmm. who they are and uh, the losses defined them more than the wins did. But that's that's neat, sir. I like that. The full, basically a three quarter court shot. Oh, nothing, I, nothing but drawers, nothing but net. After you thought you had had the miracle win, that is not easy to take for anybody. Right. A, the emotions are going both ways immediately, and you're you're drained after, and and that sticks with you. But you you look back and appreciate it. But more than anything else, what what is winning? What was winning for, at Emory? Is those the, is the people back to that? It's the relationships, the connections with those players that you recruit, who come and graduate to be doctors, teachers, lawyers, uh, business owners, whatever it might be. But those connections remain even some NBA scouts out there. Um, and the, the human connection is what matters. And going back to your definition, it's, it's cheesy, right? It is cheesy, uh, <laughs> but it, it is what matters. There's right. no doubt. So now you leave Emory. Okay. How, how did that go down? Was it, was it the, the salary you needed a little more money? Was it just time to move? Did you get a better offer? Were you trying to, to climb the ladder of success in college coaching, and where did you go? I'd like to say it was a a salary and all of that, but it was uh, it was time to move. As it happens in coaching, the head coach was uh, let go, and uh, we all moved on. And my next stop was to get a master's at Georgia State, and I became the grad assistant for the Georgia State men's basketball program with a head coach uh, that is uh, somewhat recognized in in basketball circles. Uh, One lefty Drizelle was at Georgia State and looking to build up that program and make a run at the NCAAs. So so let's just walk through it real quick. You're in Spain. You're coaching some eighth graders as a a senior, hooping it up. You end up being a practice player slash manager to help pay your way to become into the – uh, broadcasting industry at, right 
at a broadcasting powerhouse, media powerhouse of Northwestern. You uh, beat my sister in her last game ever as a college player. Sorry about that, Celia. Yeah. <laughs> now, now you come down to Atlanta, work for CNN, graveyard shift, volunteering in Emory, living mm -hmm. in dorms, riding vans, driving vans, learning from a national champion golf coach how to organize. And right. then, you're, then you're full time when he leaves to now you're a grad assistant uh, working for a legend in Left Your Giselle. And, uh, right, and, and uh, working on a, on a sports administration master's at the same time with another legend, Rankin Cooter, who was running that program at Georgia State on the, on the academic kinesiology side of things. So, so kind of neat for you not being a quote, quote, uh, you, you grew up in Spain, correct? You were born, you were dual citizen, but you grew up raised in Spain, correct? Both my parents are from the U.S., from Ohio and Illinois, but I was born and raised in southern Spain, yep, all the correct. way through high school. Now, from southern Spain to the southern United States here, you're, you're, you're putting in time in Atlanta. You've gone from Emory to Georgia State, which is still within Atlanta. Right. Two different parts, for sure, but, but still Atlanta. Uh, so now you're, you're my guy now. You're an Atlanta guy, right? So you're, you're all in, uh, in, and now you're Division One, even though it's a GA. You're Division mm -hmm. One. Now tell us, what year was this? This was 98-99. Okay. That's so this was left in second year there. Is that right? It was pretty early in his time, right? Second or third year. Mm -hmm. okay. And, of course, he got it rolling. He won some tournament games and made the tournament a couple of times. And he did right after that. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. So you're there. So what, what does a GA do in 98-99 for – the legend left you, Giselle, and the Georgia State. Broke. First of all, it was a it was a spectacular staff that Lefty had put together. Phil Cunningham, who uh, from Western Kentucky, and James Madison, and and uh, his own dad, a Kentucky coaching legend, to Mike Perry, and uh, Scott Adubato, and oh, uh, the the basketball ops guy was Pat Noise, and we can talk some more about Pat and the memory of Pat who was an Oklahoma State and Eddie Sutton guy um, who'd been a manager out there and came and was, was Lefty's uh, main basketball ops guy. And as, as the GA, you're, you're a little bit of everything, right? You're a graduate manager, so you're, you're doing laundry and carrying stuff. You're also available at practice for anything and everything that you may need from passing to rebounding to tracking stats um, and uh, all those different roles while also trying to go to class and, and make sure you're passing and writing some papers. So what was that like? I mean, for those that aren't from here, I, I mean, I, I don't even know if I can compare it great, but I, I think of Temple being in the middle mm. of a major city. Uh, I think of Georgia State. I think of those two right, right. away. I'm, I'm sure there's a million more. But, I mean, you're really in the heart of the city. I mean, you're going to walk by the, the the Golden Dome of Georgia State Capitol in Atlanta. Right. Go to a class. I mean, you're in the real city. You're not in Atlanta and you're 30 miles from Atlanta. You're in Atlanta. So, what what was that part like? I know we're a little off track, but, but I mean, Emory is Atlanta, but it's not Atlanta. It's not in the city. You're no, right. it's got its acres of campus and its Correct. greenery and all the rest. And even Georgia Tech, which is in the heart of Atlanta, right? You're on the yeah. side of the connector with 75 and 85. Georgia Tech opens up and, and, and had at the time and still does now even nicer a campus. Correct. Space. Has a real campus. Has a real campus, right. even though it's in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. Where Georgia, Georgia State, State campus is Atlanta. It's all throughout it. Fair enough. Yes. But Georgia State 20 years ago was was high rises, was buildings, mm -hmm. was maybe some plaza between a couple of those buildings. <laughs> For the outdoor sports, they had to go out to Panthersville. Correct. Um, so now with football and the old Turner Field, Georgia State's really come a long way with President Becker and what they've done recently. It's, it's, a, it's a destination kind of college for sure. Mm -hmm. But the the sports arena is on the second floor of a building so you got the marta going by you've got little overhangs and you walk in and have to go upstairs to find your your gym space and it's, it's a different feel for people who are used to a, a green kind of college campus feel 
But for people, you know, your New York cities, your Chicago's, your, your city kind of schools, your Drexel's in Philly, as you mentioned, Temple, Palestra even, it's, it's on a city block and it's, it's how you live, it's what you do. Um, and, but it can be a little harder to recruit to that. Oh yeah, let's go up to the gym here, not just some big standalone fancy building. So, so when you're there, where, where did you live? Did you live in, in Atlanta, the heart of Atlanta, or were you still doing some stuff at Emory? Or, 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 I was still uh, doing some stuff at Emory. One of those years I was over there, still the, the house director over at the Kappa Alpha house on the Emory campus. And then after that, the next year I was living in so the- So you're still wearing the, some multiple hats to be able to chase the basketball dream. Exactly. And, and like we said earlier in the conversation, enjoying each one of those uh, hats as best as possible, right? So how long did it take you to get your master's? Was it a two-year program or was it two a Two-year program. I did some summer stuff and sports administration and you're coaching and you're working camps. You're able to do one of your practicums as a, as a basketball component. So, so is, that, is that when you got involved with AAU? Was that when you got involved with AAU? It, it, it was all kind of going on at the same time during the, the, the later Emory years. And then when I was a, 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 a student at Georgia State, I was helping out with different AAU programs. Spent a uh, spring summer with the Atlanta Celtics and then uh, three, four years with the Georgia Stars, coaching up some guys, having a good time there and, and getting connected. That ended up being a big deal for you. Obviously, you're very close to Norman Parker and the Georgia Stars, working with them three or four years. And you kind of took an age group through through the growth. Am I correct in saying that? Kind of as they were younger. You are. And that, yeah, I'm grateful to to Norman and the, the confidence he gave me and Matt Lennick, Todd McGuire, um, to give us an age group. He didn't really know us uh, too well coming in, but – I think he saw that we were committed and had the kids' best interest in mind, and we were helping develop a, a group that we started with U15s and, and took them through, like you were saying, Corey, mm. to their uh, senior year and, and off to college. So some, and that some was a, fun names to be connected with there and coaching and, and playing in the Bob Gibbons, playing in the Boo Williams tournaments, all that, all that stuff across the country. What, what a neat time for AAU. It kind of had hit its uh, – maybe not its peak because it probably still is peaking, but, but it hit a, at a, a high that it had never been to before. The tournaments were a big deal and a lot bigger than they had been before. Right. And, uh, and for the – Atlanta had always had great basketball, but now the Georgia Stars and the Atlanta Celtics were kind of a big deal, whereas before you really only had Team Georgia uh, for such a long time. And uh, that had to be neat, you know, to be a part of. You put you coached a lot of guys who were high major players, you know, in Division One, uh, and you coached even some guys who, who who got you know some time in the NBA and guys who who are doing what we're doing right now. They're off the beaten path. They got into coaching, right. whatever. Yeah, we'll have to invite some of them on yeah, as, yeah, as they, we go along. Your guests, right? Just drop some names real quick. Uh, I, I I know sometimes that can be annoying to some people, but but I want people to realize how good some of those teams were. Uh, and, and uh, you know, you can say where they went if you want to, or you can just say the names, however you want to do it. I'll do, I'll do it a couple ways, and I, and, I, and I appreciate you phrasing it that way, Corey, because, you know, the whole name dropping thing, it's not what we're about. Oh, I coached this kid, and look what it is. Hey, we're off the beaten path, man. We ain't got nothing to do with any of that, right? Right, and nobody's even going to be listening to this anyway, exactly. right? It's too far off the beaten path. <laughs> But, but the, the people that were on those teams, the, the kids at the time that are, that are men with their families and their teams and all that now are, are the biggest memory. That, that U15 team that we started with, a uh, little point guard, Brian Watts, who was at Roswell with Rory Puglisi, um, they ended up winning a, a, the state championship there. Brian, an incredible little heady guy. Um, Quentin Moses who went on to, first of all, he posted up Chris Paul his sophomore year in AAU tournaments and scored on him regularly. Uh, Quentin went on to Georgia to play football, um, had quite a football career there. What but a great player. Great player, basketball and football. Um, great person. I know, I know you're not a big uh, 
UGA 1980 guy, but uh, um, Quentin. No, but I can appreciate him. Uh, thank you. Exactly. Sadly, though, he was he ended up at Reinhardt coaching football, and a couple of years ago passed away in a, in a house fire. And I Fair. always remember Quentin's kind of uh, strength, inner strength, and and the way he carried himself, and, and the way he cared about. Teammates, coaches, um, mm -hmm. and kids um, as, he, as he advanced. So that's one of those names there that uh, it's sad to, to think about, but also some great memories of a, of a great person. Georgia Stars, not the, not the side track, but Georgia Stars has probably had, I don't think I'd be mistaken, probably three to five NFL players play with them. Yes. Mm -hmm. That came through on the basketball here. side of things. One of them's from down here, Fred Gibson, of course. Yep, he was one year ahead of that group, but I worked with them a few times. Fred is a Mr. Character and a crazy athlete, too. He was a, a UGA guy, right? Correct. And receiver with the Steelers for a little while and some other teams. Yep. So keep going, sir. I'm sorry I interrupted you there, but I just I was thinking about that. Pretty neat. Now, you know, we were talking about 30, 45 minutes. This may go on and on. We're going to have to do a part two because I could go uh, keep listing these names from that U15. Well, drop us about four or that. five more. I know you don't want to want to mess it up. Uh, and like you said, we, we, we'll do a part two, but uh, uh, go with four or five more. I know, I know you had, uh, I know you had Wayne Arnold, who a lot of people, again, another UGA guy. Yep. Uh, on the basketball yeah. side, he was an unbelievable shooter, Mr. Basketball. Uh, six degrees of us again. I coached against him in the uh, my one year coaching in the ABA, W WBA. I'm sorry, WBA in a summer pro league, and uh, his team uh, won the championship that year. Uh, there you go. Cough, cough. We were the only team that beat him that year. Uh, but anyway, they they not beat that us. anybody but you remembers. <laughs> not that anyone would know that. <laughs> but uh, anyway. <laughs> but we do remember that. I mean, yeah. it, it stays inside of us. And yeah, right. so Wayne right. Arnold, and that was the U16 team when he came on board with a couple other guys, two Chattahoochee guys who were playing for Duke Mullis. Um, Russell six Aqua, degrees of the, separation. Mm -hmm. from yeah, the Russell board. Aqua, one of the best shooters I've ever seen. He was mm -hmm. a Mercer for some time. Kevin Warzinski, big kid uh, that uh, went to Charleston Southern where his brother was and then ended up at Kent State, going to the NCAAs there at Kent State. Very um, good player. Steven Warner, um, another great lefty. And then uh, adding on some players uh, is the, is the Derek Broom from the Cartersville area, went to Woodland and played at UAB. Another great um, player. Yeah, we could do names as Chris Ellis comes through. Bill Ellis, his kid who was at Marietta. Um, and, and Chris was just not a shooter like his dad, but just smooth and crafty in the post. Very he smooth. Could, yeah. You could feed him the ball and he'd, he'd find a way to get to the rim really, really well. Old man game. He kind of had an old man game, as they like to say. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Very good. He was fun to watch, too. He was very fun to watch. Yep. And, uh, Another guy that made a made a showing was uh, Kevin Kruger, son of uh, then Hawks coach Lon Kruger. Kevin over at Walton High School, um, and he went on a quite a good college career, both playing and, and coaching. Now he might be one to to. He would be great for the show, I would think. Right? Yes. Even though he's, he's a little, a, he's got a good path, a good story to tell. Correct. Correct. And uh, that's awesome. So those are some big names. So, you, so you're doing the Georgia Stars. You did the Atlanta Celtics a little bit, but you kind of stuck with the Georgia Stars. All of this kind of created due to your what your Masters was was in. Uh, you were having to do some stuff, and and of course, even if it wouldn't have been that, you would have done it. We know, but we're saying it was kind of forced to do it because of that. And then you landed, you know, with such a good person like uh, you know Norman Parker to help you and guide you and teach you. So, so now you, you were with Lefty. Did you do Lefty both years of your GA? I know the answer, but I'm going to ask for people out there. Or, or did you move on? I moved on, and, and it worked out in a, in a – you look back and say, man, what were you thinking? Um, but it sure worked out because if, if I hadn't followed this kind of path, we wouldn't be sitting here right now talking hoops years later, right? Yes, correct. <laughs> correct. But funny. It's, it's funny. The way the the way the schedule 
both for classes and the requirements of working full time at a D1 basketball program. It was something that, at least for me at the time, I couldn't do both. Couldn't do both and had to make a choice of sticking with the Panthers on the basketball side and, and putting the academics on hold or finishing up my master's. And I was so close to the master's, I said, let me get this done and then keep working my way back into the hoop side of things. So I ended up stepping away from the basketball program at Georgia State, focusing on the master's, but still working showcases and helping coach little camps and clinics and all that kind of stuff. And I'm working a showcase um, out on the uh, east side of town. And Phil Cunningham, the assistant from Georgia State, says, hey, Dan, what you doing? I said, hey, I'm studying and I'm and working some of these showcases and looking for some gigs. And he says, I just talked to the, the head coach at Clayton State. He's looking for, a, for another assistant, part-time volunteer kind of deal. I'm like, well, okay, yeah, give, give Hebron, Jim, Coach Hebron a call. So I checked in with Coach Hebron there on the connection from Mike Perry and, and Phil Cunningham, who'd been chatting with him. And next thing you know, I'm a, I'm a volunteer assistant at Division II Clayton State in beautiful Morrow, Georgia. Man, so now you have went from the, from the penthouse to the outhouse. You were in Emory, which would be probably considered the nicer part of Atlanta. The oh. downtown Atlanta. <laughs> the downtown Atlanta at Georgia State to now – the South Side. The South Side. And I don't know about penthouse to outhouse. It's what you make <laughs> of every space and every everybody that you encounter along the way. But the best part of this is it brought us together. There was this uh, assistant coach, Corey Baldwin, former player at uh, Clayton State Lakers, who was on staff. I got to ask you, Corey, what was your first thought about who is who the hell is this guy coming in? Or, hey, I got a buddy. Or what, what was your impression at the time? Because you had no idea who I was. I didn't know who you were. Well, you know, it, it was weird for me because I just finished playing. Uh, originally, I uh, was going to kind of just do uh, help when I could, almost be like a, a student manager even. Mm -hmm. And I helped with camp that summer. And uh, Hebron had interviewed a couple of people for that position, which was a different one than yours. And uh, he had called me in and he said, hey, Bill Curry was the head football coach at Tech. Mm -hmm. When he took the job, he told me he was not ready for it. But if he waited till he was ready for it, they wouldn't offer it to him. Ha. And I was thinking, where is this going? And he goes, the reason I'm saying that is I'm going to offer you the job I've been interviewing all these other people for because I think you're, I'm more comfortable with you. I don't think you're ready for it, but I think I'm, I'm comfortable with you and I think you'll do whatever you can. So do you want it? And I said, well, I guess I'm Bill Curry. I'm going to take it, even though I'm not ready. And uh, How about that? I didn't, that I didn't know that whole part of the story. That's fantastic. Yeah. The little yeah. Bill Curry reference. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, I ended up doing that. And, and Dennis Walsh, who had been an assistant at Clayton the, the entire time I played there, and uh, Coach Evans' first four years were my four years playing. Mm -hmm. He was going to take a lesser role. He was starting to uh, be a full-time teacher, and he was trying to get retirement. And back then, teaching in Atlanta, it was hard to get people, so they were counting his years coaching if he would start right then. Ah, okay. And they counted, you know, 20-plus years for him, so he jumped on it. Or at least that's the way I got the story. If you ask him, it may be a little different. I'm on the outside looking in. So he had taken a lesser role. There, there's your king of off the beaten path. Didn't yes, you so he had been an assistant everywhere at Northeastern, not Northwestern, I said it correct, Northeastern with Calhoun and – and then he was an assistant at Lamar with Billy Tubb, you know, with some guys that ended up being pretty big time. He'd been a little bit everywhere. My favorite story on him was he was a cab driver one time in New York City while being an assistant at Manhattan, you know, things like that. And I used to love sitting in the front the Jasper. seat with him, sitting in the front seat with him when he drove the van. And then I would switch vans and sit in Coach Hebron when he drove his van. And I'd get both stories. And anyway, so, so I got that job. I knew we were going to get another guy. Hebs really wanted a guy that knew Atlanta uh, and a guy that had had some coaching experience. And uh, I had no idea who he was bringing in. He told me he wasn't going to do the couple of guys he had interviewed for my slot. And he ended up taking a suggestion from, like you said, it was a Georgia State staff. At the time, I didn't know who Phil Cunningham was. Now I consider him a good friend. Uh, 
and it was a guy named Dan Searle. And when he walked in, I thought, man, who is this guy? Right. <laughs> oh, this, where's this one coming from? And little did I know we'd still be talking here, you know, uh, 21 years later. And we had an unbelievable two years together, did we not, sir? I mean, on my end, it was for sure. But uh, being assistant with you, I learned a lot of things. And you helped me grow because I was a player trying to learn the ropes, you know, and didn't really know anything other than what I knew as a player. Hey, we learned together. And those were two fantastic years. Thanks to everybody for listening, staying with us, and hearing our stories. And Corey, let me tell you, thanks for all those great questions. It is a little strange to, to be talking about myself throughout this, but good to go down memory lane and excited to hear a little bit about your career and your background as we uh, come through with episode two here in a little bit. And we, we continued episode one to two just to make sure we at least got two episodes in on our show, right? Exactly. And we're, you know, we've got to push some social media here as we build up our brand. So Instagram is uh, Off Beaten Path Podcast, at Off Beaten Path Podcast. And uh, the Twitter is at Off Beaten Path with a little underscore. You could be the first follower on both of these. Go check them out. Give us a little like and a follow. And uh, you'll know when the next episode comes up. But thanks for listening to the first ever off the beaten path podcast and this is a show for those who want to coach those who used to coach those who are coaches those who follow coaches and for those who hire and fire coaches <laughs>